Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless as a sign of his coming in the end of the age jesus declares and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Right now we're awaiting an update from the Pentagon as new evidence emerges out of Iran of the regime's nuclear weapons development. These new satellite images you're looking appear to show what experts say is an underground nuclear facility that's actually so deep beneath the Earth's surface underground it may be totally impenetrable by U.S. weapon systems. Chief National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin joins us from the Pentagon with new developments. New evidence shows worrisome progress at this nuclear facility so deep in the earth that it's likely beyond the range of conventional U.S. weapons, as you mentioned. The new site is in the Zagros Mountains in central Iran, not far from Iran's current uranium enrichment facility at Natanz. These new satellite photos and videos from Planet Labs over central Iran show what experts say is new construction that started in late 2020, shortly after a fire blamed on sabotage destroyed part of the old Natanz facility. Four entrances have been dug into the mountainside, two to the east and another two to the west, each is 20 feet wide and 26 feet tall. Today, Israel's Defense Force chief issued a veiled warning. We are also closely examining the other ways to nuclear capability. Without going into details, there are possible negative developments on the horizon that could prompt action. We have abilities and others have abilities. Iran is believed to be as close as it has ever been to developing a nuclear weapon. Experts estimate that the new underground mountain facility is between 80 and 100 yards below ground, which is the maximum range of any current conventional weapons. Currently, they've been constructing a, an underground facility over the past two years or so, two, maybe three years. And this facility is much deeper than other underground facilities that we know of, uh, including uh, Fort Doe and Park Chen. Experts fear that the site is going to be big enough to allow Iran to potentially enrich uranium at it. And uranium is what fuels a nuclear weapon. Since President Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal five years ago, Iran has said it is enriching uranium up to 60 percent, though inspectors recently discovered the country has produced uranium at 83.7 percent pure, just short of the 90 percent threshold needed for weapons grade uranium. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6 that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant is warning that the country faces rising threats from different theaters that are merging into one cohesive front. 
during an address at the annual conference of the Institute for Policy and Strategy of Reifman University, he pointed to Iran as the force that currently poses the greatest danger, not only to the Jewish state, he said, but also to the world. Since its establishment, Israel contends with complex security threats. Over the years, these threats intensify and shift into new forms. This past period, we are witnessing a clear trend in which separate fronts are converging. Behind these threats, in Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Judea, and Samaria, with which we contend today, one line which connects them all exists, and that is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran is the greatest threat to regional and global stability. Iran conducts a war of attrition against the state of Israel by means of its proxies on its borders, while in tandem, it exploits the time which it allots to further enhance its economy as well as to develop nuclear weapons in particular. Minister Gallant went on to expand on Tehran's malicious ambitions for the region and beyond. In recent years, Iran is managing a process of a geographic and ideological takeover over the countries of this region. These include Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and also the Gaza Strip. Iranian intentions go far beyond these. Under the umbrella of changes in the Middle East, Iran moves westward and it is trying to create a land corridor from the Persian Gulf toward the Mediterranean Sea. It does this via its proxies and aspires to enforce its murderous Shiite ideology and that of the dark Iranian regime. The Israeli defense minister further outlined the Islamic Republic's unrelenting efforts to entrench militants in Syria, as well as to transport weaponry via a land route through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, which, under his watch, he said, have been met with expanded Israeli force. And while the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has recently returned to the Arab fold under the umbrella of the Saudi-led Arab League, Jerusalem's top defense official reiterated that when it comes to Tehran's malign behavior, Damascus is not immune from a resounding response regardless of its renewed affiliations. Since assuming my post, the number of Israel's attacks against Iran in Syria was multiplied. As part of this campaign, we are operating systematically to strike at Iran's intelligence capabilities in Syria. These attacks exert significant harm to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard's attempts to entrench merely a few kilometers from the border of Israel. I clarify from this podium, in unequivocal terms, Syria's readmission into the Arab League has no meaning for the state of Israel so long as Syria continues to serve as fertile lands for Shiite terror and will enable Iran and its proxies to operate from its territory. So long as it continues to facilitate this reality, Syria will continue to face the power of our security establishment. Nevertheless, this is the place to stress that our target is Iran's activities on Syrian soil and not the state of Syria. Even though the Islamic Republic of Iran is active on a variety of fronts, Minister Galan underscored that such activities are merely secondary to its nuclear development program, which he stressed is rapidly approaching the moment of no return. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, 
which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49.36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in Scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18-23, and 39-2, and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time, when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. 
I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My 
my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.